there were a lot of there have been a lot of good movies over the years, um, a lot of good movies. I I ADD enough that I could just start rambling them and talking about them. I'm not going to do that though. I'm really tempted. One of the really really good movies that I saw was back in it was either 91 or 92, and I want to say it was 92. Do you guys remember the movie Dances with Wolves? How could you not remember that movie, right? Good movie. The lieutenant in the movie, played by Kevin Costner, he's sent to a post in the unsettled territory out west somewhere where the Indians were being driven from the land. And the, the lieutenant, when he arrives there, when he shows up at the post, he realizes that the post has been deserted. But he chooses, he chooses to stay. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? He chooses to stay, even, you know, against the advice of the fellow who drove him out there, on, you know, on the wagon and stuff. He chooses to, to stay in the unprotected wilderness to wait for additional soldiers to arrive. But before long, over the course of several days, the lieutenant has several encounters with the Indians from the Sioux Indian tribe. At first, it was great hostility, but hostility soon was overcome by curiosity. Curiosity was soon overcome and led to friendship. And friendship led to eventually trust and respect. And so by the end of the movie, an incredible, an incredible love and bond between the lieutenant and the Sioux Indians was forged. But the lieutenant realized, he realized in his mind that it was in the best interest of his friends, these Indians. He realized it was in their best interest for him to leave, to leave them. And when the lieutenant told the tribe of his plans to leave, one of the Sioux leaders, the one who certainly appeared to be the most ferocious and, and, and fierce, the, the, the one who was so opposed and adamantly untrusting of the lieutenant, he responded to the news of his now friend, his now brother, leaving by saying, be quiet, be quiet. You, you, you are hurting my ears. Do you remember that? You are, are hurting my ears saying these things. Be quiet and say no more. Guys, there are all kinds of reasons why we may not like the things that someone has to say to us. Think about this. There may be all kinds of reasons why we may not like the things that someone has to say to us. I did not like the things that this guy's t-shirt said to me yesterday when I saw it. Also, as an example, as in the movie, nobody likes to hear bad news. I don't want to hear the bad news. I would rather you not tell me anything than to tell me bad news. Likewise, guys, I have rarely ever known people to enjoy being told of their mistakes. You know, you blew it, don't you? You blew it. Nobody likes to be told of their mistakes, how they messed up, or about their flaws. People don't like hearing it, these things. Guys, they say that the most popular of politicians, right? They say that the most popular politicians are the ones who simply tell the people what? What they want to hear while, while they avoid showing them or telling them the things that they do not want to hear. Guys, the reality is Jesus would have been a horrible, horrible politician, right? I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to turn with me. You have an electronic Bible. You have a paper Bible. I don't care. Don't rely on the screen. It's on the screen. Bring a Bible. I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Guys, today we're going to be looking at a passage despite its clarity. 
Okay, despite its clarity, we're going to look at a passage that is often not fully understood. I think we only see parts of the things instead of seeing the whole picture. Guys, as with many of the accounts described throughout the Gospels, throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we have here in John chapter 6 is a warning. What is it? It's a what? Warning. It is a warning. So much of the Gospels, the messages, the things that Jesus talked about are warnings. There were warnings for us. This included John chapter 6. Guys, the Holy Spirit is going to reveal some things to us today. Do you know this? He is going to show us, he's going to reveal some things to us today from these verses, showing us, showing us where we, where you and I can often be vulnerable. And I'm simply praying that you will be open to what the Holy Spirit is getting ready to reveal to you, ready to embrace it and to accept it. And to recognize it and understand it. Guys, at the beginning of John chapter 6, it very simply says this. It says, some time later, I don't know, a couple of days, maybe a week, maybe a month. But some time later, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias. And... A great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then, everyone say then. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with who? With just the disciples. With the twelve. And then look at what it says in verse 4. The Jewish what? Not just the Passover, the Jewish Passover what? This whole weekend of events, the Jewish Passover festival was near. It was getting near. It was a handful of days away. Observation number one. Are you ready? People were following Jesus because he performed miracles in the way of healing people. Everyone go, wow. Wow. Guys, the motivation of the people, my question to you is the motivation of the people for following Jesus to see and to witness these miracles, was it good or was it bad? Observation number two, Jesus sat down with his disciples. Guys, we're talking about five thousand people okay let me rephrase that we're talking about five thousand men plus probably at least three or four or five thousand women plus i imagine a whole bunch of children we're talking about a ton of people right they're there they're following him they're all over the place and what does jesus do Disciples, come, come. And they go up a little bit on the mountain, and he says, sit down. And Jesus sits down with them. Why? Why? With all of these people here and everything going on, why do you think Jesus sat down with his disciples? Jesus wanted to show them something. Jesus wanted to teach them something. Jesus wanted to reveal some things to them. Observation number three. The author, in this case John, for very, very, very important reasons, points out something very important here for us. He points out that the Jewish Passover festival was coming near. It was getting close. This was on Jesus's mind. So let's take a few moments and let's think about this. Let's think about the Jewish 
Passover. What do we know about the Passover? What was the Passover? What were the elements of the Passover? How do we look at the Passover today versus how it was viewed during Jesus's ministry? Guys, if we do not ask these questions, I promise you, you are going to miss the fullness of what this passage is describing. So what is it talking about? What is here in the essence when Jesus um, is thinking about the Passover? Well, we need to remember things like Moses. We need to remember that God used Moses to, to inflict upon Pharaoh all of these different plagues. Do you remember all of the plagues? I remember Randy Kern at one point, he had them all memorized. It was vacation Bible school. We taught them. You and I were in the, the little room where we dressed up and we acted out the, the, the different things and the frogs. All of this sort of stuff, right? We also remember in regards to the Passover that there was this angel of death. This was the last plague, this angel of death that would pass over those who had the blood of the of the lamb applied, applied over their homes upon the, the, the doorposts and the threshold. If the blood of the lamb was applied, then this angel of death would pass over, right? And we know, we know from all of this, from the Passover, that Pharaoh was utterly defeated. And there was a great rejoicing among the Israelites. Guys, this is a picture image like, 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 like no, none other. Like none other. And then you have... The Passover meal. And you can't forget about the Passover meal. The Passover meal, what was its purpose? You, you remember? They were, they were getting ready to leave bondage. And they were, they were heading to the promised land, right? Um, uh, you know, the devil, oops. Well, no oops. Pharaoh had been defeated, right? Pharaoh had been defeated. It's resurrection day. Pharaoh had been defeated. And they were headed to the promised land. The place where you and I are at right now. The devil has been defeated. And we are on our way to the capital P-L, promised land. We are in this place. But there's this Passover meal that we have to understand. What was the purpose of the Passover? over meal to nourish the body for the journey to the promised land. Now, in describing this, we, we should go back and look at Deuteronomy chapter 8. We would do well to do that. So you have Deuteronomy 8. You can flip on your phone, move. I should hear pages moving right now, okay? Um, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Don't you dare rely. I, one of these days I won't have it up here and it'll be, oh man. So Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 through 5, we need to recognize this. It says, be careful to follow every command I give you today. Do you know what's going on here? The Israelites had made it to the promised land. They've arrived. They're getting ready to go in. They're getting ready to take possession of it. And he says, be careful to follow every commandment that I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. The Lord has promised us a land, an eternal place. Remember how the Lord, this is what he says, remember how the Lord your God led you all of the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble you, to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you really love God, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you 
causing you to be hungry. And then he fed you with his manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known anything about. He did this to teach you that humanity does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That's the food. That's what we need. It, 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 it's more than just, just the things of this world. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes, he's reminding them. Think about these last 40 years that you were in the desert. Your clothes did not wear out. Even your Converse, your Nikes, your, your buddies, your Pumas, your, uh, your what? That right there as well. All they didn't wear out. Your jeans didn't wear out. You didn't bend down and hear the crack and the rip and all of that stuff. None of those things happened. Your clothes did not wear out. Your feet did not swell during those 40 years. Amy, I don't think they had back aches. I don't think when they went to bed at night, they felt their knee throb, their hip hurt right there, and their back ache, and they didn't have to roll back and forth ten times waiting for the uh, um, ibuprofen PM to, to come and have its way. Your clothes didn't wear out. Your feet didn't swell up during those 40 years. Know then, know then, church, know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his, his children, so the Lord, your God, disciplines you. Do you guys also remember how on the night before Jesus' crucifixion, when he sat with his disciples in the upper room, do you remember the words? Do you remember the things that Jesus said to his disciples? Do you remember when he said, this is my body, when he handed them the bread? This is my body given for you. Do this, eat this. In remembrance of me. He handed them the cup, the wine. He said, this cup is the new covenant that I am now making with you, that God is making with you, this new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. Take this, drink this, my blood, shed a new covenant for you. Guys, most people recognize, recognize that there's some strong imagery, obviously, here, correct? Strong imagery. There's, in fact, two images. Two images on display. Sometimes, sometimes people will recognize the first, but not really truly recognize the second. The blood of the lamb to escape the judgment and, 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 and the, the penalty of sin. And the penalty of sin is always, every single time, without exception, what? Sin brings about what? And yet the blood of the lamb, we can escape the judgment because he gave his blood to redeem us in exchange for us so that we don't have to live in sin, we don't have to live broken, we don't have to experience eternal death because of the blood of the Lamb. The second imagery, the bread. The bread. The body of Christ feeding on the Word of God. Gaining sustenance, sustenance for the spiritual journey that we face. There are two images here. Guys, I said it a million times. Please hear me. I've said this a million times. I really, really, really get frustrated with some of our other churches that are out there. 
Because I, I know there are some churches that say, you need to be saved. You need to be saved. And, and they'll, they'll, they'll sit there and they'll emphasize that and everything else. And then once they're saved, they're like, hallelujah, you're saved. Off and be gone with you. And, you know, whatever. You can come on Sundays, give us your tithes, whatever else. But, yeah, you're saved. So we're good with you. Let's, let's move on to the next one. Guys, I'm telling you, that is not... That is not God. That is not a loving God. Guys, I'm telling you what. For, for God just to sit there and, and, and say, hey, you know what? Your sins are now forgiven, but you're, you know, they're forgiven. I'm not going to hold them against you, but you still have to deal with the effects of all that nasty sin that you're, you know, that, that, that's totally, you know, enveloped you. So you go on and you can keep sinning and you can keep, you know, having the effects, you know, divorce and loss of jobs and, and um, addictions and, and all of this a horribleness that goes on. Guys, that is not a loving God. I am so sorry. But God is a loving God. He is a loving God. He is a God who wants to forgive us of our sins. And he is a God who wants to bring us up out of sin so that we're not committing sin, so that we don't have to deal with the horrible effects of sin all the time in our lives. He wants us to have a good life in this world today as well as giving us eternal life in the world to come. And some of you are, 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 are going through such brokenness. Some of you watching online, you guys, you guys are going through such things. You, you have these, these feelings and this bitterness and this judgment and this, these addictions and, and these different things that that's just eats up at you. And you wonder why you are so miserable. You're constantly trying to, to, to prove to people that you're something and, and trying to convince people that you're happy and then trying to do all kinds of different things and stuff to, 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 to try to even just convince yourself self that life is good. And yet, why is it that nearly 65% of people in America today are having to go to their pharmacies every month and get some drugs to try to get them to chill out a little bit? People are not happy. People are, are, are miserable. They're, they're tense. They're upset. They're, they're, they're all kinds of, of different things. And, and, and the, the, the reality is, guys, they're dealing with these effects Sin is sin because God doesn't want you to have to deal with the horrible effects of sin. Why would God just say, hey, you know what? I have eternal power. I am omni-everything. <laughs> and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll forgive you of, of your sins, but I'm going to leave you to struggle and wallow and, and deal with the horribleness and the horrible effects of sin for the rest of your life. Is that a loving God? If, if, if my kid was, was, was messing up and, and, and is having horrible effects on him, and I just looked at, at Matthew or Bethany and I said, and I said, you know what, it's okay, I forgive you, but go on and, and continue on in your messed upness. I want good things from my kids. I don't want to have my kids hurting and broken and, and, and wallowing in, 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 in the effects of, of their bad decisions, right? I want to have, give my kids peace. I want to give my kids wholeness, wholeness. I want my kids to be able to take a deep breath and, and, and know, wow, I, the Lord has given me the eyes to see and to make good decisions so that I can go through my day helping people. Yes, dealing with the effects of other people's sins, but not having to deal with the effects of my own brokenness and my own daily sins. Most people recognize that Jesus died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven, but unfortunately, unfortunately, they fail to recognize this second image of the Passover. Guys, the, the reality is today we are in the desert. That's where we are. Temptation is all around us. We feel the urge to grumble. We feel the urge to question. We feel the urge to push back against God. We feel the urge to doubt. We feel the, the urge to, to be in fear. We feel the urge to complain, and we feel the urge to rebel. We're no different. Guys, are these not the exact things, all of the exact 
same kinds of things that Moses and the Israelites faced while they were in the desert, while God was leading them to the promised land. And guys, do you remember, do you remember what the Israelites' biggest struggle was? I'll, I'll, I'll move this along, but do you remember what the Israelites' biggest struggle was? Do you remember what they complained and they grumbled about above everything else? What are we going to eat? Mom, do you remember me saying that all the time when I was a kid? Mom, what are we going to eat? She finally gave up after I sat there in the chair and refused to eat the chow mein for four or five hours. And I won't even get started on the eagle's nest, bell pepper stuff nastiness. Uh, Dad loved it. My brother loved it. I, I, I was going to sit there all night. There's no way on this God green, God's get, green given earth that I was going to eat that bell pepper. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Have we been led out here to starve to death and to die a miserable death? Guys, the meal before leaving on the journey, the Passover meal and the manna, the manna that, that God provided, this bread that came down from heaven that appeared on the ground six days a week that would spoil if you tried to keep it overnight except for, except for, on the, the morning of that each Friday so that it would be good for them to eat on the, on the Sabbath day. Guys, Jesus is the spiritual food. Jesus is the spiritual food. Jesus, his teachings, his, his words, those are the spiritual food needed to, to sustain us along our journey. His words, his truth, the light that, that gives us sight, the strength to succeed, God's spiritual nourishment, which empowers us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I'll include Peter and Paul and John's writings as well. Only because they were smart enough to reiterate the things that Jesus said. In verse 35 of John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty ever. It's basically the same things that Jesus said to the woman at the well. You keep coming here to draw water, and I'm telling you, I will give you living water that will dwell inside of you, my Holy Spirit, that will fill you, that will remind you of all of the things that you have read, all of the things that you have heard me say, all of the things that, 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 that you, you need to know to make it through this world. I am that bread. I am that, that, that sustenance, spiritual sustenance that you need. Again, in verse 48 through 51, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna out in the wilderness, and yet they died. I mean, God provided manna for them in the, in the desert, and yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven. Here is the bread. I am the bread, Jesus said, that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat, and they will not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Whoever feeds on my words will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. And once more, beginning with verse 53, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up in the last day. For my flesh is real food, not, not, not um, material food. It's, it's real food. It's 
spiritual food. My flesh is spiritual, real, the, the, the truest of, of, of anything that, that exists. My flesh is real and my blood is real to drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the, the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me, who feeds on me, will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors, yes, they ate manna, but they died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. I really suspect that it was providential. I think it was, it was God's intention for me to, to see the guy say, raise hell, praise Dell. I have no problem with Dale Jr. or Dale Sr. Um, I, 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 I'm not stupid. I live uh, in Indianapolis. I realize that these NASCAR drivers are, are amazing drivers and, and whatever else. And Dale Sr. especially, wow, what a, what a gifted guy that he had. I have no problem with that, n n none of that. Um, if I lived in South Carolina, I'd be bashing IndyCar. You know it's the truth, right? You know it's the truth. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm a Colts fan and not a Pittsburgh fan. Guys, I, um, we, we look, we take advice from, from anyone and everyone, and we Google all kinds of stuff. And I, I tell you, I, I, I am a man of one teacher. Um, just a man of one teacher. And I, everything that I need to know uh, is, is found in, in, in the Word of God. And uh, guys, I, I promise you, if you look to Jesus, if you read his word and you feed on his word and you, you seek to, to memorize, to understand and to memorize his word, your life will be completely different. If you seek to hear it, learn it, understand it and apply it, your life will look so different. He's not done with my life. Jeff, how can you say that? Yeah, I know you. You're still an idiot. And you're, yeah, I am. I, uh, but I'm going to tell you what. I'm not nearly the idiot that I was before, said the Stotts. Or said the, um, you're the Hartmans, aren't you? As well as the Stotts. All right, ask my mom. She'll tell you. Dad will tell you too. God loves you enough to forgive you of your sins. And God loves you enough to help you not have a train wreck of a life. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I, I thank you, Lord, for our time together today. I'm uh, thankful it was awfully, awfully fun singing our songs to you this morning. It was Wonderful to be able to lift each other up in prayer. Lord, we continue to, to, to pray for the many, many people that are, that are in need, that are hurting, that have health things going on, uncertainties, these, these silent prayer requests. Um, I'm grateful, Lord, that we've been able to do these things. But Father God, I know that you have eternal things that you want for us, that far outweigh, that far outweigh these temporal things of, of today and tomorrow. Father God, I, I pray that, that we would be wise to invest in the eternal things. Your word is eternal. They have e eternal um, consequences, eternal um, uh, effects upon our lives. Lord, I, I pray that above anything and everything else, Lord, I pray that instead of turning on our, our, our televisions, that we would first turn on our, our, our Bible apps 
and open up our, our scriptures to read and to learn and to study. I pray that we would prioritize to re to put things in the proper order. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to be the absolute best examples that we could ever possibly be for her children, recognizing them that this is first and foremost, this is eternal, this is important, then comes, you know, such and such and this and that and whatever. Lord, please, I, I ask that you would help us to do these things. I'm grateful, Lord, that you're always working in our lives, whether we are five years old, 55 years old, or 85 years old. I am so grateful, Lord, that you continue to bring good things, drawing us closer to you if we allow you, if we seek you, if we, if we feed upon you and your word. Lord, forgive us of our shortcomings. In the name of Christ, I pray, forgive us for our shortcomings. But just as much, Lord, we pray, help us, Lord, to be transformed, to have the, the new life, to become the new creation that you long for us to have. For I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You do not need to sign up to come on Wednesday. If you would like child care on Wednesday, you can let me and Amy know. You should be able to go back, maybe even today, on the church's website and find last Wednesday's uh, thing. If not, you can go to our YouTube channel. I know it's there. Everything is on our YouTube channel. Um, if you can't find it, text me. And if you're going to be baptized, let me know. And um, bring really good food for the fall festival because that's just our, our the picnic. Somebody, somebody bring some really good food. All right. Lord bless you guys. Love you all. Y'all are amazing. God bless you all.